Hello and welcome to today's revision session on electromagnetism. So in today's revision session we're going to review the concepts of electromagnetism. Now the first topic we're going to look at is magnetic flux and magnetic flux linkage. So previously we've looked at the ideas of magnetic fields. Now we visualize the effect of magnetic fields by drawing magnetic field lines between magnetic poles. So you can have like a bar magnet, you can have a current carrying wire, there's lots of different examples of magnetic fields which you can draw. Now, the magnetic field lines give you a measure of the total magnetic field. Now, another name for magnetic field lines is magnetic flux. So, it's important to note that the magnetic field lines gives you a measure of the total magnetic field. And we define magnetic flux as the total number of field lines passing through a defined area. Now, in simplified examples, the area is considered to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. So, it's very important when we look at this that we look at the concept of magnetic flux. Now, we measure this idea in Weber's or WB. Now this defined region in our definition can be any area. It's the area most suitable to the situation you have been given. So our key definition is the magnetic flux is a measure of the total number of magnetic field lines passing through a defined region of space. Now magnetic flux density is a measure of the magnetic field strength of a magnet and it is how many field lines there are in one meter squared. So our key definition now is that magnetic flux density is a measure of the total number of field lines passing through a defined find region of space per unit area and we now measure the magnetic flux density in teslas now since magnetic flux density is the flux per unit area one tesla is equal to one weber per square meter so let's just look at the two ideas the magnetic flux is the total number of field lines in a defined region perpendicular to the magnetic field now the magnetic flux gives an indication of the total magnetic field of a magnet and it is measured in WB or Weber's, and we give it the symbol phi. Now, magnetic flux density is the number of field lines in a region per unit area, which we normally set to one meter square perpendicular to the magnetic field. It gives us an indication of the magnetic field strength of the magnet, and it is measured in Tesla's or T, and the magnetic flux density symbol is B in our equations. So there are different ideas completely. Now, we can link these two quantities with an equation, that magnetic flux is equal to magnetic flux density times by area. So it's in our units, it's Weber is equal to Tesla's times by meter squared. So therefore, our symbol phi is equal to BA. Now, we can rearrange this to say B equals phi over A. Now, this equation makes sense as the magnetic flux density B is the flux per unit area. Now, if we consider an infinitely thin 2D shape, so for example, a sheet, we can assume that the shape is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and this gives us the equation phi equals BA. However, what happens if the shape is not perpendicular to the magnetic field? magnetic field. Well then at this point we've got to use a little bit of trigonometry to work out what our value is going to be. So now we've got to work out what the component of the magnetic field is. So now we do cos is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, so cos is equal to the component over B, so therefore the component of the magnetic field in this direction is B cos theta. So this allows us to rearrange our equation to read phi is equal to B cos theta times by A, and this is the full equation which links magnetic flux and magnetic flux density. Now it's very important to think about how does this equation work for a wire in the real world because we don't live in a 2D world, we live in a 3D world. So we've now also got to consider the thickness of the wire as well. It is not infinitely thin. So to do this we consider the number of turns on the wire and we consider this on both sides of the equation. So now the equation becomes n phi equals b cos theta times by a times by n where n is the number of turns of wire in the magnetic field. So we can read arrange the equation to read n phi equals b a n cos theta. Now to symbolize the impact of adding the number of turns of wire to the equation, we call n phi the flux linkage. Now the flux linkage is the linking of the magnetic field with the conductor of the coil when the magnetic field passes through the loops of the coil. So our key definition now is that magnetic flux linkage is the product of the magnetic flux and the number of turns on a coil through which the field passes. Now the magnetic flux linkage gives an indication of how many field lines pass through a conductor in a chosen region of space. Now even though turns of wire is a dimension 
dimensionless quantity, it's just a number, we call the units of flux linkage Weber turns to differentiate uh, between the magnetic flux and the magnetic flux linkage. Now remember, this means that Weber's and Weber turns will have the same SI base units because the value of turns does not have an SI unit. So therefore, when we do this equation and we read out n thi equals b a n cos theta, it's very, very tempting to cancel out n on both sides of the equation. But we don't do this because flux linkage is very important in electromagnetic induction. As we'll look at in a little bit, the induced EMF in electromagnetic induction is directly proportional to the rate of change in the flux linkage of the conductor, which we call Faraday's law of induction. Now we can also, um, when we look at this, we can remember that flux linkage is altered by B, the magnetic flux density, A, the area of the coil of wire, and N, the number of turns on your wire. Now in addition, the angle cos thi between the flux and the area also affects your flux linkage. So your greatest flux linkage occurs when your area of the coil is the largest, the number of coils in your wire is the greatest, and the magnetic flux density of the magnet is at its highest, and the flux and the coil are perpendicular to each other. Now let's look at electromagnetic induction. If we consider a conductor placed in a magnetic field, there is going to be a magnetic force on the conductor if there's a relative motion between the magnetic field and the conductor. So it can mean the conductor moving, the permanent magnet moving, or the two objects both moving relative to each other. Now this will also produce an equal but opposite force on the permanent magnet, but we're not going to look at that in this particular example. So if we use Fleming's left hand law, we can work out the direction of the motion of the conductor uh, in this particular example, and we can then understand that the force on the conductor is an accumulation of the individual forces on the electrons in the conductor. Now if we know that each electron in the conductor experiences a magnetic force, and we know what this is from the left hand rule, we can determine the direction of this magnetic force. Now because this magnetic force acts on all the electrons, it will cause them to accumulate at one end of the conductor. So they'll all move to the right hand side and go away from the left hand side in this particular example. This gives us one side which is a negative and the other side which is a positive, as shown. So what we've done is we've produced an electromotive force across the conductor. We've induced a difference in the potential. So this is what we call an induced EMF in the conductor. And this will lead to an induced current flowing in the conductor if the conductor is part of a complete circuit. Now this is the idea of the generator effect and how current is produced in power stations. Now the change in how many field lines or magnetic flux the conductor cuts per second determines the force experienced by the electrons in the conductor. So the change in, ma in magnetic flux linkage per second determines the value of the induced EMF in the conductor. Now remember the magnetic flux linkage tells you the number of field lines a conductor cuts and the change in magnetic flux linkage experienced by a conductor will determine the induced EMF. Now therefore we can link these ideas to form a new equation which is going to read the induced EMF is equal to the change in flux linkage over time or we can say delta n thi over delta t. So we can write it out as following. So this indicates to us that the induced EMF EMF in a conductor is directly proportional to the rate of change in the magnetic flux linkage in the conductor. Now because we that now the number of turns aspect can be taken out of the change part of the equation because the number of turns on your coil isn't going to change as you're carrying out this particular work we can move n to outside the delta. So we now write it as n delta thi over delta t. Now this links into what we call Faraday's law of induction which determines the magnitude of the induced EMF in the conductor. So we know that if we display this information graphically, we put flux linkage against time, the gradient of our line will be the induced EMF, and it's common in examination questions to present information in that particular format. Now we can also understand if we place induced EMF against time, we'll get the following graph, and the area in this idea is the flux linkage. Once again, it's common to present information in this format in an examination. Now the most common example of electromagnetic induction is when a coil of wire is rotating in a magnetic field. Now let's understand what's going on in this concept. As the wire rotates, the wire changes its magnetic flux linkage, and because we've got a change in magnetic flux linkage, that induces an EMF in the wire. Now, when the wire is parallel, the induced EMF is the largest, because whilst the magnetic flux linkage is very small, the change in magnetic flux linkage per second is very large, which is shown in these particular values. Whilst the values are small, the change per second is large. Now, when we have the wire perpendicular to the field, the induced EMF is the smallest, because whilst the magnetic flux linkage 
linkage is very large, the change in magnetic flux linkage per second is very small, which is shown in these particular values here. Because whilst the values are large, the change between each value is very small. Now for a rotating coil in a magnetic field, the following graphs will be produced. Now you'll notice you'll get maximum induced EMF when you have a very small magnetic flux linkage. Now here you can tell this is going to be the case because you've got the change as being the largest, so the induced EMF is being the largest. Now at this point, these are our minimum values of EMF because whilst the magnetic flux linkage is a big number, the change in magnetic flux linkage is the smallest, so the induced EMF is going to be the smallest. Now you will notice that the flux linkage and the induced EMF are always 90 degrees out of phase with each other, with the flux linkage leading the induced EMF. Now we can link this idea to the rotation of a, the orientation of a coil in that magnetic field. The maximum EMF is induced when the coil is parallel to the magnetic field as the change in the magnetic flux linkage is the greatest, whilst the minimum EMF is when the coil is perpendicular to the field as there's the least change in magnetic flux linkage. Now we can further alter Faraday's law of induction because we can say delta thigh is equal to the number of flux cut, so it's flux density times by area. But area is going to be equal to length times by distance, and distance is going to be equal to velocity times by time. So we can rearrange our equation for delta thigh to read B L V delta T. So we can pop that into our equation. Our values for time cancel through, so we get EMF is equal to N B L V. Now it's important to note this equation is not given to you in your examination book. It is more of a common sense equation, because consider the factors that would alter the rate of change of flux linkage. The amount of flux linkage determined by the flux density, the number of turns of, of the wire, the thickness, and the length of the conductor, but also the speed at which the field is changing, either the velocity of the conductor or the velocity of the magnet. Now it's also important to note that if you are doing a length of wire or one conducting rod, it's only one turn, so the end term can be set to one. Now this particular equation indicates there's a directly proportional link between the speed of the conductor's motion or the magnet's motion and the induced EMF. So doubling the speed of rotation doubles the maximum EMF and halving the speed half the maximum EMF. Now we can also further this equation to show the direction of the induced EMF in the conductor. Now it's important to note that the induced EMF will always be produced in the opposite direction to the change in flux linkage that causes it. This is called Lenz's law and this must be memorized along with Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. So if the change in flux linkage is caused by moving the conductor down, the induced EMF is produced upwards in the conductor. So this means the magnetic field produced in the conductor is going to be in the opposite direction to what is being what the movement has been caused so as a result the wire will resist its movement to cause the change in flux linkage because the conductors of the permanent magnet and the conductor will repel so it means that the production of emf provides a resistance to its own production and this naturally limits the largest value of emf possible in the generation because if the emf was in the same direction to the change that caused it the following would take place well the production of emf would then cause a further attraction between the conductor and the magnet so it would speed up the conductor as it would be attracted towards the other ma magnetic pole, this would speed up the conductor, increase the uh, rate of change of flux linkage and produce a greater EMF. So you can see that this is a positive feedback cycle and would eventually lead to infinite EMF being produced and the conductor traveling at infinite speed and you would be creating energy in the universe. So this would be impossible and why it doesn't take place. Now Lenz's law has many applications in the real world, such as back EMF in motors. Now a motor works as a current passes through a coil and this makes the coil an electromagnet. The electromagnet it interacts with the permanent magnet and it spins. Now th the reason why it spins is because there's a different uh, force on different sides because the current going through the different sides of the motor is in opposite directions. So what happens is the motor then spins. So what happens is the conductor passes through a magnetic coil. It's rotating. So there's a change in flux linkage. It induces an EMF in the motor. But Lenz's law states that the EMF is produced in the opposite direction to the rotation of the coil. So this is the back EMF. Now the back EMF slows down the spinning of the motor as the EMF is acting in the opposite direction to the wanted EMF in the motor, so Lenz's law ensures motors have a top revolution speed as the faster it spins, the greater the back EMF induced. Now another common example is looking at a magnet falling through a conductor as it links to Lenz's law. They will fall at different speeds. Now a magnet falling through the air will fall quickly, but a magnet falling through a conductor will fall slowly. Why is that? Because when it falls through a conductor, okay, the idea of the magnet falling through the conductor leads to a change in flux linkage in the conductor, so therefore the conductor will produce a current as well 
when it's part of a complete circuit. Now this occurs due to Faraday's law as there's a relative motion between the magnetic field and the conductor so there's a change in flux linkage and induces an EMF and a current. But as the copper rod is now carrying a current it's also an electromagnet which produces a magnetic field. But due to Lenz's law the induced EMF produces in the opposite direction to the change that caused it this means the magnetic field is in the opposite direction. So the magnetic field of the electromagnet repulses the magnetic field of the permanent magnet as they are in opposite directions. So this this opposes the motion so therefore it falls slower. Now the fact that the current the conductor con cutting through the magnetic field can produce a current in the conductor is the generator effect or induction. Never forget that. So what happens in the following example? There's a magnet falling through a glass tube, a magnet falling through a high resistance iron tube and a magnet falling through a low resistance copper tube. The magnet in the glass tube falls the fastest, the magnet in the low resistance copper tube falls the slowest. Why is that? Well it's easy for the glass tube because there's no change in flux linkage as glass is not a conductor so there's no repulsive magnetic field so the magnet falls solely due to gravity. But in the other two the low resistance copper tube will allow the magnet to fall through slower because in this one there is a change in flux linkage as copper is a conductor so there is electromagnetic induction in the copper. This produces a repulsive magnetic field according to Lenz's law and slows the, the magnet down. And it's the same in the high resistance iron tube but because it has a higher resistance in the actual iron the same induced EMF that was in the copper is going to actually produce a smaller current because there's more resistance so the repulsive magnetic field is smaller so the magnet can fall faster than the copper as there's less resistance from the actual magnetic field. Now let's just clarify how we can look at the idea of a coil rotating. Now when we have a coil rotating the angle at <coughs> which the coil rotates is given as theta. So we can say that flux linkage is n phi equals b a n cos theta and we define this angle as the angular difference between the conductor and the magnetic field lines. So it's normally used to define the angular difference placed at the center of a conductor. So this is the angle that changes as the coil rotates. Now we know that as the coil rotates uh, theta changes so the flux linkage varies from plus BAN to minus BAN. Now this change occurs as the direction of the conductor changes in its rotation and we can graph, we can just display this following idea graphically. We go from plus BAN to minus BAN as shown. Now interestingly like we said before the induced EMF is out of phase with the magnetic flux linkage by 90 degrees because the change in magnetic flux linkage produces the EMF. Now this links again because one graph contains the sine term and the other graph contains the cosine term. So how fast theta changes depends on the angular speed of omega and we know theta is equal to omega t so we can sub that into the equation and say now b a n cos theta is equal to b a n cos omega t now we know that n phi over t is emf so we can now re rewrite this as b a n omega sine omega t because the differential of cos omega t is omega sine omega t so what this shows us is that the induced emf is the largest when the conductor is parallel to the magnetic field so sine sine omega t is sine 90 which is equal to 1 so therefore the maximum induced EMF for a rotating conductor is EMF is equal to BAN omega which is an equation given to you in your examination book. So again this shows us the induced EMF is largest when the conductor is parallel to the magnetic field as when the conductor moves to this alignment the conductor has the greatest change in magnetic flux cut per second. Now again remember EMF is caused by a change in the number of field lines being cut not the number of lines being cut. So it's important to know that whilst the magnetic flux is small the change in magnetic flux is great which is an important idea to note. Now when the conductor is perpendicular the induced EMF is going to be the greatest possible value okay, because the magnetic flux linkage is the smallest possible value. So here in this particular example this shows that the induced EMF is zero when the conductor is perpendicular to the magnetic field. We can see this from the equation because sine omega t becomes zero so the value is going to equal zero. Now what this means is that when it's perpendicular okay, there's the smallest change in flux in field lines cut per second because remember the the induced EMF is caused by the change in the number of field lines being cut, not the number of lines being cut themselves. So when the conductor is perpendicular, the smallest EMF is induced because when you have this, the numbers of field lines cut is large, but the change per second is very small. So we can process this in graphical form, and this graph shows the change in magnetic flux linkage over time for a rotating coil. And this follows the cosine curve as there's a cos function in the equation. Now again, the gradient of this line is the induced EMF in the generator. 
Now, this graph shows us the change in induced EMF over time for a rotating coil and follows a sine curve as there's a sine function in the equation. Now, this is the trace that will form on an oscilloscope when measuring the induced EMF in a rotating coil. So we get our peak voltage here, our peak to peak voltage here, and that will then lead to an alternating current flowing in the conductor if the conductor is part of a complete circuit. So this is the trace that would form on an oscilloscope when measuring the induced EMF in a rotating coil. And the oscilloscope trace can be used to measure the frequency of AC. So the shape of the graph of the induced EMF can be altered by changing the speed of rotation or the size of the magnetic field. Increasing the speed of rotation will increase the frequency and increase the maximum induced EMF. Increasing the magnetic flux density will increase the maximum EMF but will have no effect on the frequency. Now like we said before when we compare the magnetic flux linkage and induced EMF graphs you can observe the two values are pi over 2 or 90 degrees out of phase. The flux linkage is always ahead of the induced EMF and this occurs as there's the change in flux linkage that produces the induced EMF. So what we can say is the magnetic flux linkage is a cosine curve and the induced EMF is a sine curve. So you can see our flux linkage is a maximum of 0 and 180 whilst our induced EMF is a maximum of 90 and 270 which again occurs in instances of being perpendicular because there's no magnetic flux uh, cut at this point much like how at a maximum height an object is stationary and we can look at the other idea of being a um, instance of being parallel because the magnetic flux that's the maximum magnetic flux much like how equilibrium the object is moving the fastest so let's have a look at alternating currents in the process of electromagnetic induction a current and emf can be induced in the conductor so you can have a direct current where the charged particles all follow the same direction which leads from a direct emf across the conductor which is produced when the relative motion between the conductor and the magnetic field is in the same direction the second type of current is alternating current where the charged particles oscillate in the same formation in the conductor. The charged particles all move backwards and forwards in the same um, same pattern, so we get an alternating EMF across the conductor, which is produced when the relative motion between the conductor and the magnetic field is changing direction, such as in a rotating coil. Now, measuring devices such as voltmeters and ammeters can be used to measure current and voltage, but they tend to be used to measure direct current and direct voltages. To look at alternating current and alternating voltages, we've got to look at another device, and that is an oscilloscope. Now, this oscilloscope is based like an advanced voltmeter it can display direct and it can display alternating voltages so we connect many oscilloscopes of signal generator to generate an alternating voltage so this trace is made by an oscilloscope uh in the oscilloscope we have an electron beam moving across the screen so therefore we can determine some key facts so if we look at our oscilloscope display our y axis represents the voltage of the circuit which can be either emf or pd depending on what you want to measure and the scale of the y axis is called the y gain so if the y gain is set to two volts this means every vertical square represents two volts we can alter this in an investigation uh, by with the experimenter now you alter it to improve the results so what happens is the entire waveform should be displayed on the y axis and in addition it's it's important that the key parts of the waveform are placed on the axis to make it easier to measure. This reduces random error and increases the accuracy of the results. Now this can involve a line in the key part of the trace with a square or a graduation. So you've got no extrapolation involved in your values. Now negative values are there to represent the possible alternating nature of the voltage. If the line in the oscilloscope trace stays solely positive or negative, it's direct. Now the X axis represents the time measurement. So again, the scale of this is called the X gain. So we set the X gain to 20 millis seconds every horizontal square represents 20 milliseconds now again it can be altered by the investigator in an experiment now you should alter it so that the entire waveform can be displayed on the x-axis and in addition again you place the key parts of the waveform on the axis to reduce random error and increase accuracy of the results now some oscilloscopes can have their time base set off this means the x-axis no longer represents time and the waveform is not considered as a wave with a change with respect to time so what you can do is this common examination question to look what would happen if the trace was turned to the trace if the time base was turned off in these questions you don't have to consider any time measurements now if you've got a direct voltage if the blind the thing produced would be a dot if the time base was turned off so this is an example of an oscilloscope trace with its time base set off if the values were direct now an oscilloscope if it's alternating and has its time base turned off will produce a line as shown like this so this is what the line will be produced to show alternating voltage now 
An oscilloscope trace for direct voltage produces a flat line when the time is turned on. Now you'll notice the larger the supply, the higher the line. And what we can do is we can work out the value of this direct voltage uh, by looking at your Y gain. So this is an example of that. Now, an oscilloscope trace for an alternating voltage when the time base is on looks like the following. It looks like a sine wave. Now it's important to know that this will occur if there's induction via rotation. So the positive shows one direction, the negative shows the other direction. And voltage reading should be taken from the center point or the equilibrium position of the wave where the displacement is zero. So again, this is the waveform you would find via electromagnetic rotation for a rotating coil in a magnetic field, which is shown here. Now again, for good practice, the Y and X gain should be altered to see the full waveform in the screen, and the key points of the wave should be placed on axes for measurements. Now there are several key terms we've got to understand. We've got time period, the time it takes for one complete wave, and remember frequency is equal to one over time period. Now measure the distance between successive peaks along the time axis gives you the time period. Now you can then use this to calculate the frequency. The peak voltage is the maximum voltage from equilibrium. It can either be the plus value or the negative value. It's a measure of the energy in the circuit. Now the peak voltage is the maximum possible induced EMF in the conductor, which we looked at before was BAN omega. Now the peak to peak voltage is the maximum negative voltage to the maximum positive voltage. And it's again a measure of the energy in the circuit. Now it's a lower percentage uncertainty in measurements. It's easier to measure peak to peak voltage from the oscillator telescope, then half it to find the peak voltage. Now again, you will note that this waveform is formed when there's a coil rotating in a magnetic field. And what you can then do is if the coil is made to rotate faster, the time period would decrease and the peak voltage would increase as there's a greater change in flux linkage. Now, if you place a coil in a stronger magnetic field, the peak voltage would still increase as there's a greater change in flux linkage, but the time period is then unchanged. Now, neither the peak voltage or the peak to peak voltage will provide a comparison to the direct voltage. This comes from an average voltage. Now the average voltage of an alternating supply is needed when comparing the voltage of a direct supply. Now the peak cannot be used as the supply will not will normally be lower than the peak for an alternating supply, but a simple average cannot be taken because the average voltage of an alternating supply would equal zero due, due to the positive and negatives in the trace cancelling each other out. It's similar to trying to find the average speed of a randomly moving particle. So we use the same principle to solve this issue. We use the root mean square voltage, where the root mean square voltage is equal to V0, where V0 is the peak voltage, divided by square root 2. Now, the, the root mean square voltage needs to be used, otherwise any average value would equal 0 and not be a true measure of the energy found in the circuit. Now, this equation is given to you in an examination booklet, and it's the stated value of voltage for any alternating supply. So, the main supply has actually got a root mean square voltage of 230 volts. You can have your current equivalent, so root mean square current is equal to I0 over square root 2. And therefore, the power in the alternating supply is VRMS times by IRMS. Now you've got to remember these particular ideas. So what you would do is if you had to look to work out the root mean square voltage of a power supply, you would take your peak and divide it by square root two. And to calculate the power of your power supply, it's the root mean square current times by the root mean square voltage. Now the last thing we're gonna look at is the idea of the operation of a transformer. Now to understand how a transformer works, we've got to know the structure of a transformer. So all transformers have a metal core in their center and they're made of a soft magnet such as iron. Now a soft magnet is a magnet which can change its magnetic field easily. So a soft magnet can have a rapidly changing magnetic flux. Now if a magnet is not soft, when its magnetic field is changed, the energy is lost due to hysteresis. So that's a very important idea. So we need a soft magnet to produce a rapidly changing magnetic flux. Now wrapped around one arm of the transformer is the primary coil. Now for the transformer to work, this input circuit must have an alternating potential difference. So remember, our primary coil is set up with this input circuit, as shown here. Now on the other arm, there is a secondary coil. Now the primary and secondary coil wires are not connected electrically, they are separate circuits. So what happens is this is then connected to an output circuit or a load circuit. So it's a very important idea that our primary and secondary coils are not linked to each other. So let's now consider how a transformer works by considering one electron in the the primary coil wire. So in this particular idea, what happens is that because there's a free electron and it's moving, these moving charged particles will produce a magnetic field. So what will happen is that they will then alternate backwards and forwards and therefore produce an alternating magnetic field in our primary coil. So this makes the magnetic flux of our primary coil alternating. So this has our rapidly changing magnetic flux in the primary coil. Now because the iron core is a magnet, it interacts with the primary coil's magnetic flux. And what this then does is it then causes the air magnetic field 
of your iron core to alternate as well. So it makes that alternate also. And at this point, we've got our iron core with our alternating magnetic flux. Now this then produces a rapidly changing magnetic flux in the magnetic core. So the iron core has become an induced magnet because um, it's been helped. So basically what has happened is that this has helped when we've got a, a soft magnet. So because it allows us our rapidly changing magnetic flux. So the soft uh, magnet iron core prevents energy losses due to hysteresis in the transformer process. Now a hard magnet would dissipate energy to the surroundings when its magnetic field alternates. So the iron core is acting to amplify the alternating magnetic flux produced in the primary coil. So this will increase the change in magnetic flux linkage experienced by the secondary coil. And this is important because it increases the magnitude of the magnetic flux linkage in the secondary coil. So it's ultimately going to boost the induced EMF in the secondary coil. Now linking into this, the secondary coil is a conductor. In this conductor, there'll be a change in magnetic flux linkage because the magnetic field of the iron core is alternating backwards and forwards. So whilst the conductor is not moving, the magnetic field is alternating. So this alternating magnetic field causes a change in magnetic flux linkage. So this induces a potential difference in the secondary coil via induction. Now remember, the change in magnetic flux linkage induces a potential difference in the conductor. And the size of the induced potential difference is directly proportional to the rate of change of uh, flux linkage. So the secondary coil is part of a circuit, so this will lead to your induced EMF leading to a current being produced. Now again, like we said before, uh, the change in flux linkage induces a potential difference in the conductor which links to a current flowing in the conductor. Now, the secondary coil is being influenced by the alternating magnetic field. So as a result, that is why you need an alternating current to produce an alternating magnetic field in the core, as that's what allows the secondary coil to experience a change in magnetic flux linkage. A direct current in a transformer leads to no potential difference in the secondary coil, as whilst there would be a magnetic flux linkage in the secondary coil, there'd be no change in magnetic flux linkage. So you'd have no induced EMF. So that's how a transformer can transform the current between coils without them touching. Now we can show how it works with the following animation here, okay, or here as shown in this particular animation. You can see what's going on, how they link to one another to each step. So let's have a look. In the primary coil, an alternating potential difference in the primary coil leads to an alternating current in the primary coil, which then leads to an alternating magnetic field in the core. This alternating magnetic field in the core uh, will have an induction effect as there's a change in flux linkage for the secondary coil, so it leads to an alternating potential difference in the secondary coil, which then leads to an alternating current in the secondary coil as that secondary coil is part of a circuit. So it's important to know that the size of the alternating uh, size of the potential difference is directly proportional to the rate of change in the magnetic flux linkage. Now it's also important to note that we can link all of these particular concepts together. Now a transformer has several adaptations to help it with its job. Now it needs this to work efficiently. So, what do we know? The induction process can lead energy being dissipated to the surroundings. So the wires are insulated to prevent a short circuit, otherwise electrons will travel through the iron core and stop the transformer effect. So that's a very important idea because our primary and secondary coils are not electrically linked, they are separate circuits. So it's important that if the circuits were combined, there'd be no change in potential difference, so we've got to ensure that they are insulated. The core is also laminated to prevent any magnetic currents forming in the iron core. Laminated means the core is covered in insulators such as plastic. Now this would mean that the current cannot flow. Now why does a, a large eddy current form? Well Lenz's law states that when induction occurs an eddy current creates a magnetic field that opposes the magnetic field that created it so those eddy currents react back on the source of the magnetic field like we talked about before. It's a version of back EMF. It's the magnetic field version of resistance. So what happens is eddy currents are always produced in the induction process because it always produces a potential difference which opposes the change which caused it. So when the secondary coil has a current flowing through it, it must be flown in the opposite direction to the change that caused it due to Lenz's law. This will produce an alternating magnetic field in the opposite direction to that of the core. So these are the eddy currents found in the transformer. Now remember the eddy currents are effects in the magnetic field, not the electrical circuit. So eddy currents will dissipate energy by generating heat. And another way to lower the production of eddy currents will be to make your iron core out of a material with a high resistivity. So the higher the resistivity, the lower the current produced due to the induction process. Now ideally, all of the magnetic flux 
created by the primary coil will go through the secondary coil, but that's not always the case, especially if the two coils are far apart. So the coils are designed to be as close as possible to each other. Now this can include winding the coils on top of each other around the same part of the coil rather than different parts of the coil. Now as well as that, uh, these adaptations mean the transformer can carry out their function in a very efficient manner. Now we can assume that they are 100% efficient, but that is not really true in reality, so we've got to be able to calculate the efficiency of a transformer. Now efficiency is equal to useful power out over total power in. So it's the power of the secondary over the power of the primary. So it's Vs times by Is over Vp times by Ip. So the core is the iron core is laminated to reduce magnetic eddy currents and made of soft iron to allow easy magnetic field reversals to prevent heat loss via hysteresis. The core is made from material of a high resistivity to lower the production of eddy currents and the wires around the transformers must be insulated. The transformers are very efficient but larger ones require cooling which but we can still calculate the efficiency of a transformer easily. Efficiency is useful power out over total power in, so it's Vs up times by Is over Vp times by Ip. Now we can look at how many coils are in a transformer to work out what job it does. Now the more coils or turns of wire, the greater the EMF in that part of the transformer. This happens as the greater the number of coils, the greater the change in flux linkage, as was shown with the equation Ban cos theta. So the n value is greater, the magnetic field flux linkage is greater, which can lead to a greater change in flux linkage. So either the thicker the conductor, the more field lines which pass through it. So it's important to note that when the magnetic field alternates, it will give a larger induced EMF if you have a greater number of coils in your transformer. So what this means is that in a step up transformer, the more turns there are, the greater the flux linkage change per second. So therefore the more potential difference induced per second. So therefore, if there's more secondary coils and primary coils, you've got a step up transformer as the potential difference will increase. But if you've got more primary coils and secondary coils, the potential differences will be in step down so you've got a step down transformer so it's important to know those two ideas when you're looking at step up and step down transformers always remember that the more coils or turns of wire the greater the induced emf but we can express this term mathematically if we look at the ideas of faraday's law of induction vp over equals mp times by change in thigh over change in time so you can do that for the primary coil we can do that for the secondary coil now we can link these two equations together to form the transformer equation because they both have the term delta thigh over delta t in them so the rate ratio of the potential differences in the coil is the same as the ratio of the number of turns in the coil, or Vp over Vs equals Mp over Ns. Now this equation occurs as the voltage induced is directly proportional to the change in the magnetic flux linkage, which is Faraday's law of induction. The change in magnetic flux linkage is directly proportional to the number of turns in the magnetic field. Now please remember in this equation that the it refers to the root mean square voltage. That's because the transformer works on alternating current and alternating voltage, and this equation is given to you in your exam examination book. So you will work out your answer for a question such as the following, write out the transformer equation, sub in the values, rearrange and work out your answer and always do a logic check. The more turns, the more p, the more potential difference, the less turns, the less potential difference, but always work out your value as shown. Now let's just look at how this links into the national grid. So what you have is you have, you have electrical energy produced at the power station at 25,000 volts. It then goes through the step up transformer and increases it to 132,000 volts. Now this is due to the fact that when you have a higher potential difference you have a lower current so the energy losses due to the heat and effect of the current are reduced to almost zero so it increases the efficiency of the power transmission of our electrical energy so transformers are useful because the transmission of electrical power over long distances is more efficient at a high voltage than a low voltage we then get to our consumer but before that we have our step down transformer which decreases our potential difference to 230 volts making it safer to use so we've got generation where the electricity generates 25,000 volts due to electromagnetic induction Production. Then a step-up transformer increases the potential difference to 132,000 volts in the transmission cables. Because if you have a high current, it will dissipate a lot of energy to internal resistance, to internal energy of the surroundings due to resistance, so you have a high potential difference and therefore a low current. So it increases the efficiency of electrical energy transmission. Then a step-down transformer decreases the potential difference to 230 volts, making it safe to use for the consumer. If we did not have transformers, the high current needed to power devices would be quickly dissipated due to resistance in the transmission cables. So let's consider how this works. When you've got a current going through a transmission cable, you will get a resistance in this cable. The resistance in the transmission cable causes energy to be lost to the internal energy of the surroundings. So a high current leads to a high power loss because there's an energy dissipated to the surroundings very quickly, so there'd be no electrical energy at the consumer output, so the device would not work. We can calculate this power loss with the equation I squared R. Remember where I has to be IRMS as it's an alternating supply. So this shows a high current in the cable will dissipate a 
large power from your transmission cable and a low current will dissipate little power from your transmission cable. So it's the aim of a step up transformer to reduce the current to the lowest possible value in your transmission cable. You can also reduce your power loss by having a low value of resistance in the equation. So that can be achieved by making your cable out of a low resistivity material or making the cables very, very thick. Now we know in a transformer that we can assume that the efficiency is 100%, so therefore the power in a transformer is considered to be constant. And we know power is equal to potential difference times by current. Now it's important to remember that in the national grid, the electrical power is thought to be constant throughout a transformer, but it can vary in the transmission cable, which is the electrical power entering or leaving the transformer. So let's consider our transformer. If we know P equals VI, if we increase V, I must decrease, which has to be constant throughout. So therefore that then can go through our, our transmission cable and lead to a low power loss because our value of I is very small. So therefore P equals I squared R, little power loss. Now we can then also go the other way and say, well, V goes down, so current goes up. That will then give a high power loss because P equals I squared R, but it's a trade-off because then the potential difference is safe to use at home. Now remember throughout these particular questions, without these particular calculations, we're using V, RMS and I, RMS. So transformers are useful because the transmission of electrical power over large distances is more efficient at higher voltages compared to lower voltages. The power in a transformer is constant as we assume the transformer is ideal. So we can say P equals I, RMS times by V, RMS, but the power loss in the transmission cable can vary for a cable, which can be calculated with the equation I, RMS squared times by R. Now both of these equations have the common term of I, RMS. So we can also say power loss is equal to P squared R over V squared, where P is the power of the transformer. Now, the first equation, P equals I squared R, indicates a low current in the transmission cable reduces the power loss from the cable. The second equation, P equals P squared R over V squared, indicates a high voltage will reduce the power loss in the transmission cable. Both equations indicate that the, that the power loss will be reduced from the cable if you have a low resistance, which is achieved by making the cable from a low resistivity material or from making the cable with a thick diameter. So let's summarize what we've looked at in this revision session. Magnetic flux is defined by the equation Thi equals BA, where B is normal to A, flux linkage is N thigh, where N is the number of turns cutting the flux, and flux and flux linkage passing through a rectangular coil or magnetic field is equal to N thigh equals B A N cos theta. We should understand simple experimental phenomena with Faraday's law, Lenz's law, and know that the magnitude of induced EMF is the rate of change of flux linkage, and understand that the EMF induced in the coil rotating uniformly is B A N omega sine omega t. We know that for sinusoidal voltages and currents only, we know the root mean square peak to peak and peak values for sinusoidal wave forms and understand the main electricity peak and peak to peak voltage calculations and the use of an oscilloscope as a DC and AC voltmeter to measure time frequencies intervals and display AC waveforms. You should be able to understand the transformer equation, the transformer efficiency equation, the production of eddy currents, the causes of inefficiency in the transformer and the transmission of electrical power at high voltages including calculations of power loss in transmission lines. So I hope you've enjoyed this revision session on magnetic fields in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and I know as always, have a lovely day.